Welcome to The Woman's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Woman's Connection is a program about events shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power on a personal or professional level. So won't you stay tuned? Welcome. Our guest is one. Welcome. Our subject tonight is one we don't normally like to talk about. And what I'm talking about is finances. Our guest is a co-creator of a household brand. She's an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, an educator, a, C a licensed CPA, a mother, and a wife. Do it over again. Get deep breath, a couple of deep breaths, and relax. <laughs> Want me to hold it? <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Welcome. There's one subject we all don't like to talk about, and that is finances. Our guest is the co-creator of a household brand. She is an entrepreneur, author, philanthropist, educator, international speaker, licensed CPA, a wife and a mother. Currently, she's on the quest to educate the public at large about finances and managing your own money. I would like to welcome Sharon Lecter. Hold on. Oh, you dropped. OK. Sharon, welcome. Thank you so much, Barry. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Sharon, let's start in the middle of your life. OK. All right. You became involved with I was going to start with you became involved with Rich Dad series of books, but that doesn't go with what I had said. No. Okay. You started, no. You became involved in co creating a household brand. Why don't we start there and tell us about that? Well, certainly. Actually, we rolled back a few years before that. In 1992, my oldest son went off to college and got into credit card debt. And I was pretty upset, more upset with myself than with him. And so I really wanted to be involved. At that point in time, I dedicated my professional life with my passion as a mother to really concentrate and dedicate my professional life on, on the pursuit of financial literacy and financial education. Then in 1996 is when I met Robert Kiyosaki. And he had drawn a game on a piece of paper. He needed some help patenting it. He needed some help getting it to market. And so we started working together, just as my background had been in publishing and my background had been in game technology. And so I was helping him get that started. And he asked me to co-author a book with him called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And so we became partners and co-authors on Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And then we formed a company together. And as a result, we have lots of games, tapes, series, books. We did 15 books together. And we were partners for almost 10 years. Wow. But that didn't end on a good note. What happened when it got resolved? I mean, you resolved. <clears throat> I'm so tongue tied. I don't believe this. Things didn't go smoothly towards the end, and you dissolved the partnership. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go into it, because I'm sure you don't want it either, but what advice would you have for somebody going into a partnership and making sure there's an exit strategy? Well, I, I tell my kids, I tell people that are going into business, um, plan the divorce before you get married. The same thing in business. You know, when you start a business together, you're both on the same mission, you're aligned. That's the time to really say, if at some point in the future we decide to disagree, we need to have a, a, a organized plan to be able to dissolve the relationship. And we had talked about it. We hadn't followed our own medicine. So when we decided Robert wanted to go into selling businesses and selling franchises, I still really wanted to concentrate on educating families and young people about um, financial education. And so while we had been very aligned for many years, we, our missions were no longer in concert. And so it was time to separate. And we had many companies together, and it was a very tangled situation to get out of. And so it's very, it's very draining. 
But what I tell people is stand in the truth, stand up for yourself. Many times women try to be nurturing and we end up not standing up for ourselves. And so I really want, the message I want to give people is when you go into partnership with someone, sit down while you're still friends and while you're still really excited about the new business and say, let's say I become more passionate about it than you do and you want out. How are we going to do this? Or let's say we get hugely successful and, we, and one of us wants to retire and the other one doesn't. How are we going to get out? And let's say even though we don't think it's ever going to happen, in 10 years we have a big fight and we don't like each other anymore, how are we going to get out? So just like many women go through divorces in their marriage, also prepare yourself when you go into a business relationship is how are you going to be able to exit fairly for both of you? All right, looking back, mm -hmm. what would be the key to say how to dissolve it fairly? Well, I think it, the bottom line is what's your relationship, you know, what's your percentage ownership, and agree to get a valuation of the company and then determine the best way to get out of the relationship based on the valuation and your relative interest. And what happens is sometimes people get, then they disagree about the valuation. So you need to have a mediation, have someone come in and help you do it fairly and separate fairly. But you know, there's always, when you put emotion and money together, you know, blood and money or business and money, when you're passionate about what you do and money gets in the way, you tend to have problems. And the best way is to just try and go as, as emotionless as possible through the process of determining what the valuation is and be fair to each other and then wish each other well. I remember, I don't know if this, I remember some time ago somebody told me that when you go into a business, have an exit strategy that one can buy the other person out, one person puts the value on and the other person has the option to buy or sell. And I've never forgotten that. I haven't been there yet, but that's one thing I've never forgotten, and that's like a long time ago. Well, my father told me once that, uh, and he passed away about four years ago, but he said, I'm going to make it really easy. I have one sister, so there's two girls. He says, one of you is going to divide up the estate, and the other one gets to choose which half she takes. <laughs> So it's like, okay, that sounds like pretty fair. Mm -hmm. So the same type of thing in a business is make sure that you have some sort of uh, semblance of reasonableness and valuation, and, and above all, try and be fair to each other. It doesn't always work, but it's It doesn't good. always work. But, and then that's when you really have to stand up for yourself and stand in the truth. And women don't really stand up for themselves. They step back and say they're not good. They're just, you know, Poor, not, I was just going to say poor me, but that's not the attitude. They don't feel they're good enough, or they don't try enough. Or they don't though. want the conflict. Right, right. Yeah. You said you were also a licensed CPA. What made you take that road? Well, when I was in college, I was actually going on a dual track. I was going through the accounting department um, in the business school, and I was also going through science because I wanted to study genetics. And so my senior year in college, I realized I could graduate in one year in accounting. I had five more years if I wanted to go through the sciences, so I made the decision to get my degree in business. And I don't regret it for a minute. I, lo I loved my time. I started at Coopers and Librand in Atlanta. I was the fifth woman ever hired in the southeastern United States, so it was really a pioneer time for women in accounting. But it was a wonderful opportunity because I had the opportunity to see so many different businesses. And I got to learn all the right ways to do things. And I also learned a lot of the wrong ways to do things. As you went in and helped people with their finances, you could see where they'd made mistakes and the consequences of those mistakes. So it was a fabulous learning opportunity. What would you say was the biggest mistake you found as you were doing this? Well, I think you know, certainly when you're in that, in that environment, when you see that there's irregularities, you get concerned. And, and that's where you realize it's so important just to do it right the first time. Because when there's an irregularity, it can, it can snowball and the domino effect can create a much bigger problem for the business, even if it was an unintended one. There are more women starting businesses today than ever before, and women are at the peak of 
starting businesses or their entrepreneurial spirits mm -hmm. for many, many reasons. Okay, the demographics show that 40% of the businesses in the U.S. are owned by women. 1,600 new businesses, this is to quote from your statistics, are started every day. What are the five things that you would suggest for a woman to come to grips with when starting a business? I know we talked about an exit plan. Mm -hmm. What else would you suggest? Well, I think there's a dedication, and when you talk about entrepreneurship, many women still talk about the glass ceiling. Well, there is no glass ceiling in entrepreneurship because you're your own boss. And so you, the opportunity is understand what your goals are and create little wins. And the same thing whether you're a woman or a man is to understand that you are the driving force. You're the leader of your business. And make sure you bring in other people to support you. So not only plan your exit strategy, but create the team of masterminds around you. Napoleon Hill came up with the original mastermind concept. And many women feel so burdened that they have to do everything themselves. Get rid of that. Bring in a team. Bring in other women and other men that can help you speed through the process and get them as advisors so that they can help you in creating it and bring in that depth of experience that they have from, from their business experience. And that's going to help you. Don't try and do it by yourself. Get the team together. And then the other one is to remember it's so important to have associations. So while you have advisors, you also want to reach out to different business networks, business groups will help you speed your way to marketing so that you can market to a group as opposed to one-on-one. -on -one. And that's so important. And the other thing is to remember to serve, not to sell. Such an important thing, and really I believe the future of business is one of collaboration and cooperation, not competition. And women are much better at that than men, so it's an advantage for women. But I ask them, when you sell something, that's a transaction. Here you are, you give me money, I give you something, and you're gone. If I serve you, you're going to remember that, and the next time you need something, you're going to come back. And so really when you're setting up your business, make sure you service your customers. And again, that gratitude is so important, saying thank you and showing that you value them. They'll come back to you because you feel, make them feel good. And so make sure you serve, don't sell, and gratitude would round out those five elements. Now, you've become very involved with Napoleon Hill organization. In mm -hmm. fact, you've just written a book called Three Feet from Gold. You yes. co-authored with it. How did that come about? Because I found it fascinating. I mean, it's like the right time in my life. And you also have um, a formula at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. So would you please elaborate? Sure. It's such an honor. I was so thrilled when I got the phone call. But in fact, going back to your original question, I was kind of in a, in a, in a doldrum in my own little pity party because things were not going well with my partner when I tried to, just, um, when we were separating. And so I was really frustrated and I knew I was right. I knew I knew was standing in the truth. But I was frustrated, and so I got a call March 20th, 2008 from the Napoleon Hill Foundation. And I'd been working with them on doing some international work for them. And they called and said, Sharon, we have this project, and um, it's not quite where we want it to be. We'd really love to have your expertise and your input on, on the project, which was the book Three Feet from Gold. My co-author, Greg Reed, a wonderful young man, had been gotten it started and had interviewed quite a few leaders. And it really is a sequel um, related to perseverance that was talked about in the book Think and Grow Rich. Napoleon Hill wrote the book Think and Grow Rich and published it in 1937, just after the Great Depression. And so the foundation, many people today that are successful credit their success to having read Think and Grow Rich. And so the foundation said, we really should bring out that same kind of advice and that same kind of hope to persevere through the current economic crisis. If you remember, it was September of 08, you know, the bottom fell out. This book was released in November of 2009. And the, the, it's such a gift of hope and inspiration. We interviewed over 35 of today's leaders, not about their success stories. 
but about their deepest, darkest moments when others would qu have quit and they kept going. And we talked to them, how did you keep going? How did you put one foot in front of the other when others would have quit? And the title, actually, Three Feet from Gold, is from the first chapter of the original book, Think and Grow Rich. There was a story about a young man named R.U. Darby who went out west with his uncle to discover gold. And they did. They had a mine. They got great gold. They got so excited. They went back east, brought out more family and more money and more equipment. And they kept digging. And all of a sudden, they ran out of gold. Dirt. They get more dirt, more dirt. And they were so frustrated, they threw up their hands, dejected, sold their, their mine and their equipment to the city's junk man and went back east to Maryland. Now, the junk man had been there for 20 years, been studying gold mining, knew all the right people to talk to, and he would, had just waited for his chance, and here it was. So he went out with an engineer, mastermind, surrounding yourself with the right people, and the, and the engineer said, this is really easy. They just punched right through the vein of gold. If you go back to where they started and go three feet in the other direction, you'll tap back in to the vein of gold, and exactly what the junk man did. And at that time, he discovered one of the largest gold mine, gold, gold discoveries of his time. Now, the story doesn't end there. R.U. Darby, back in Maryland, hears about this success, and is he upset? Yes. But he also says, I will never, I'm going to learn from this mistake. I will never give up again. And he went on to build a very large insurance company and started teaching others the power of never giving up and persevering. And so in thinking in Three Feet from Gold, we did that same thing. We went out and talked to people about how they persevered. And we had many people that we talked to that you would recognize their names, their, their company names. You may not recognize their individual names. But if they had given up, we wouldn't have things today like Remax Realty, um, like we wouldn't have things like um, Mrs. Fields Cookies, Velcro. Can you imagine a world without Velcro? No. <laughs> <laughs> and so we really got down to the, 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 these creators, these innovators, and how they kept going when times were tough. Uh, move your hair because it's hitting the mic. I love, I love the book, but you didn't interview enough women. Is there a sequel coming? Yes. The, uh, actually, when I first got involved, there were no women in it at all. And so that was the first thing I did, was I added women to the book. And um, I am in the process right now with the Napoleon Hill Foundation of writing Think and Grow Rich for Women, which will be all women, as well as for kids. So I'm very, very honored to have the relationship that I have with the Napoleon Hill Foundation. But you're right, we need more, we need more success stories for women. In the book, there's also this formula. Mm -hmm. Would you just elaborate on that a little sure. bit? It's called your personal success equation. Okay. And it truly, it, it was hit home for me. And it's called come, taking your passion. And what's important is when you hear about passion, people say, do what you love, love what you do. Well, in, in this process of writing this book, I realized passion can also be something that makes you angry. Oh, that's interesting. For me, I was angry about the lack of financial education. That's where my passion comes from. And many people think passion is something that you love. So I really want people to think about it. It may not be what you love. It may be what, you, what angers you, that gives you that, that courage and that innovation to make a difference. So take your passion, combine it with your talent, Mine, my talent was in the publishing industry, and my talent was also being a CPA. My passion was the passion as a parent. So you take your passion and your talent, and you find that right association. Remember how we started, mastermind, and then finding associations or groups that you can join that can help you spread your business. So passion, talent, right association, and then taking the right action. Now, I'm sure many of your viewers have heard of the book, The Secret, and the movie, The Secret. It talks about um, the law of uh, positive attraction. Well, that actually was first written about by Napoleon Hill. In 1919, I believe it was, he wrote about the law of attraction. 
And so The Secret was a great, great book, great movie. And it talks about thinking positive thoughts and having positive things happen to you. But Napoleon Hill added an element to that. So you have to take the right action. We've all been given two legs, two arms, and a mind. You know, you really have to work hard and go that extra mile. And so the personal success equation is passion, talent, with the right association, and taking the right action. And we really were almost done with the book with that as the personal success equation. And then something was bugging me. Because there's just, there's more to this. And I really, I kind of almost went into seclusion, saying, what is it that's bugging me? And I went back and I talked to several of the people that we had interviewed. And there was an undercurrent, foundation element of faith that they each had. And so the personal success equation is your passion combined with your talent, with the right association, taking the right action, but throughout it all, having that courage and that faith in yourself, faith in what you're doing, to persevere. That's your personal success equation. I like that. That's not bad. But while you're going through all this, a lot of times you get the fear factor. Mm. How do you get out of the fear factor and move on? I love that question. Thank you for asking it. Because fear can do one of two things. Fear can paralyze you, which it does to most of us. Or fear can motivate you. And so think about when you're in the middle of fear, say, am I paralyzed or am I motivated? And if you're paralyzed, force yourself to go somewhere new. Go to a new networking group. Go to a new church. Expand your horizon and introduce yourself to new people. It forces you to be positive. Say hello, make a smile. And it gets you out of that fear. And again, the answer to fear is faith. Faith in yourself, faith and hope in the future. And that's the, the, the fear. Fear is such a debilitating thing. In fact, um, it's not in the book because I was preparing for a talk just last year. And I looked up the definition, and it was to women. And I looked up the definition of the word worry. Now, I am a champion worrier. I came from a champion warrior, my mother. I, I came honestly through. But the definition of to worry is to pray for what you do not want. Now just think about that. Pray for, pray for what you do not want. Yeah, to pray for what you do not want. And that means that you bring to you what you don't want. Got it. You don't want to do that. Right. You want to pray for what you want. Right. And so worrying is you're concentrating and you're surrounding yourself with what you don't want to happen. And we tend to attract that to us. And it was very impactful for me. That is, that is a very impactful yeah. concept yes. of thinking about it. You also created a children's game. And it's called Thrive Time for teens. All right, you know my question. When's one coming out for women and what's this all about? Well, this has been a 30-year download. This is what I wanted to create when, for so long ago. It is really a game about life. It's a game, it teaches young people that they are the sum total of the decisions that they make and that they need to think about the choices they make in life without being dictatorial, without being, you know, truth and dare. It's basically, it's a fun, humorous game uh, where kids are where they start the high school, they've got a part-time job, and they're drawing cards, and every choice they make either takes them to thrive, to win, or diving into debt. And, they're, and without, throughout the game, it's based in humor. And we've been so thrilled, so honored that the kids that play it love it. And, and in addition, we've had set, won several awards um, for the game. We've had um, WTS five-star rating. We've had the Hallmark Channel did a special on the game. We won the um, Mom's Gold Choice Award just a few weeks ago, which was very exciting. Congratulations. And Creative Child Magazine named it the Game of the Year. And it's just been really, but the, more importantly, are the lights come on when teens play it. And we teach something called Be Fab, which means be fabulous. As part of the game, we teach presentation skills. 
And if you think about youngsters or teenagers, young adults who are their pants are hanging down and they're slouching and they're looking at the floor, they don't look at each other. And so we have them practice doing that, pull their pants down a little bit, slouch and do a fish handshake, don't look at each other. And then we go through the acronym BFAB, which stands for back straight, eye contact, firm handshake, ask questions and allow for answers, and above all, be bold. And just in a couple of minutes, you can change a child's life, giving them the tools of how they can present themselves and come across much, much better in job interviews, um, in college applications. And we've had kids that were 11 years old come back to us and say, oh, I've been complimented on my handshake and my eye contact. I just, I love it. And it's also part of the game. Everything we do has a big element of charity involved. So when you start the game, we ask you, do you want to donate to charity? Well, nine times out of 10, they say no, because they want the cash. And so as they play the game, they'll pull a card, which is a BFAB card, be fabulous, and they have an opportunity to um, either win the raffle, charity raffle, or they've been to a charity auction and they met somebody who wants your help um, getting their rent, so you become their business partner. And then at the bottom, they go, only available to givers. And so a child understands the consequences of not giving, and they understand the benefits of giving, but through learning. And it's experiential learning. And many kids today, we, we just hammer them with reading and with lectures. I wanted them to learn through experiencing. We really ignite the entrepreneurial spirit. Wow, that's quite a concept. Now you're developing one for women. How is that going to be handled? The same way or? Yeah, it's actually not one specifically for women. It's one for adults. Okay. And it's going to be available um, in 2011. And it's going to be more, you'll start the same basic concepts, but instead of being a young person, you're going to be an adult. You're going to be married with kids, married without kids, single with kids, single without kids. And so you'll actually be able to emulate your own life as you play the game. And it's also the same thing. Very important when you play this game is to understand it's equally as important how you spend your time as it is how you spend your money. And that's what a lot of other financial games and financial people out there don't really bring into play. Time is so important. Are you sitting on your sofa watching TV every night, every weekend, and then complaining because you don't have any opportunities? Are you complaining because um, you know you just don't feel like looking for a part-time job, or you don't really want the hassle of having a part-time business? Great, those are choices that you're making. And you'll, le you'll learn the consequences of those choices by playing the game. But it's all based in humor and fun. Lots of fun in the game. A lot of people I know like to whine, poor me. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I walk away from those people. I cannot be around them at all. Yeah. In the book, we have a, one of the phrases we have in there is, um, you don't want to walk away from negative people. You want to run away from <laughs> negative people. Sometimes they're in your family, a little harder to do. But that's when you want to counterbalance that negativity by surrounding yourself with people who truly are positive and share in your desire to be successful and will help propel you to success. I think the people who don't help you are, in, are negative towards what you want to do are either jealous or insecure themselves, mm -hmm. and that's the way they feel that they can be powerful by taking you down. And sometimes they don't even realize it. It's subconscious on their part. Um, I don't know if you've heard the story of the lobster in the box. No. Or a crab in a box. You put a crab in a box and it crawls right out. You put two crabs in a box and neither one gets out because they pull each other down. And so I think part of it is that our families and our friends are so concerned with change. They're afraid. It comes back to your question about fear. They're afraid. And so th they inherently become negative about what you want to do. And that's when a lot of it, they don't really understand that they're being negative. So if you can recognize it, that's, that you're halfway through the battle. Because then you can say, okay, this is how you feel. 
and that's fine. But you, then you have to decide, I'm only going to allow, if that, I allow that to impact me, that's my choice. So you have a choice of whether you let somebody else's attitude impact you. True. Move your hair. you got to move your hair. Okay. In something I read of yours, I've mm -hmm. read a lot of stuff on, <laughs> a lot of background information. You said that a person needs a million and million point two to retire with an income of fifty thousand dollars a year. I have two questions on that. How old was the person that would be retiring, and how many years would that last you? Well, the, that number is assuming an essay that doesn't get drawn on, okay? So it doesn't matter what your age is. And it also assumes a 4% interest rate. Now, we all know we're not making 4% right now. And so when we, but we wanted to compare the, the level of retirement across certain age groups. And so what we did was we used that as a benchmark. 1.2, 1 1.1 and a quarter million dollars at 4% gives you a $50,000 income per year, just straight interest on it. But we also wanted to look at where we were as a country. And the scary thing was when I did this analysis, the median average of what people have away for retirement in America is $2,000. $2,000? Yeah, and it's pretty scary. Hold on one second. Gloria, I don't know what's going on out there. Okay, go. Thanks, sorry. Um, and so when we, when we did this analysis, there, I, just, I had other things that really shocked me. Not only was the median amount of retirement that Americans have put away only $2,000. That's shocking. So 1.2 million is kind of like an un, unrealized opportunity, but they haven't even put away more than two grand each uh, as a median. And so then I went further. And uh, there was an article about single black women's average net worth, five dollars. Yeah, it's pretty scary. Married black women, net worth, 125. Married Hispanic women, net worth, 150 dollars. This is scary. And women need to take control of their financial lives, and we need to help each other. We need to help support each other's businesses. We need to support each other through helping with babysitting or just purchasing and buying from other women business owners. Move your hair again. I'm, I'm speechless with the statistics you just threw at me. I mean, is it because People figure that Social Security is going to be around, the government's going to be around to take care of them, or they were poor earners and therefore they had to live on what they earned. Um, I'm just speechless. Well, there's a myriad of reasons. Obviously, we know that women tend to earn less than men. Um, and if you are a minority, if you're Hispanic or, or a black woman, you typically, um, you may not have the best advantage of getting a, the, a high paying job. You may be, I mean, this goes to all women. They are the ones typically that have the children in a divorce situation. And so they have to be saddled with childcare as well as having um, to work for a living. And so you find a standard of living for all women when you get divorced decreases because you're saddled with two households now. The husband has got his household, you've got yours, and you typically have the children. So it makes things much more stressful. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is not trying to become an employee. The solution is in including your children. Teach them about money by starting a business together. Let your children help you with a small time business. Have it out of your home so that you can be with your children. You don't have to have the child care. And get started with a small business about something that you love or something that makes you angry, passion, and start small. And those few dollars every few weeks, you can actually make some money and put it aside and help start building your business. One young lady I met had um, 
her children were in all kinds of sports. And she was really frustrated because they're always having to spend all this money for all these tr snacks. So she started making snacks and take them to the sporting activities and all of a sudden she's selling them. And she says in one month she made a thousand dollars making crispy treats and buying bottled water and taking them to where she was going to be anyway. So it was a great entrepreneurial thing for her to do. Everybody won. The people who were there who were thirsty were able to buy a, a water and get a treat. And she made extra money for her kids and her kids helped her make the, the treats. So everybody was involved. Lemonade stand on steroids. Barry. <laughs> yes. We have almost 36 minutes, and I want to get some reaction shots, and I want to get some shots of the uh, stuff you have in the background, too. Okay, well, then use another tape. You want to put another tape in? Fine. We have, I'm just letting you know, 36, <laughs> so we have about four, we have about six minutes. Well, why don't you just switch the tape, then I don't have to worry. Go on, because it... Okay, okay. When you speak of an investment policy, what do you mean? Well, part of what you need to do is actually create a plan, short-term plan and a long-term plan. Because when you're not thinking about it, then you're not actually putting money away. And so you really need an investment plan that works for you and where you want to be in life, whether you're married, whether you're single. And what happens with, with women that are married is they, they really don't think about it. They don't make a plan. They assume they're going to be married forever. And that's something that's so important for women to understand, to make sure that they have something in place. And one hour of your time is all it takes to go see an attorney and put on paper what you want for your children. And if, if we have so many blended families today, it's so important. What happened, we have a, a, a friend just last year who suddenly passed away and her kids now are with some distant aunt because her step the, their stepfather didn't have a legal right to them. And that family was ripped apart because the documents weren't in place. And it's so important, you truly, if you want to know that your kids are taken care of and you want to have, be in control of where they are, just sit down and put together your will, put together your plan that works for you so that your kids and your family isn't ripped apart should something happen. You made a DVD. Mm -hmm. called women, wait a minute, did a DVD called Money for Women by Women. Mm -hmm. And in it you talk about the various forms that somebody needs. And it's just good sense that people don't think about manana, manana, manana. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? I think today has come. Right. And people have got to really take part in their health care, their finances, and it's not for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Well, and by, it's, it's penny wise, pound foolish. Some people say, I can't afford an attorney. Well, you really can't afford not to have one in today's world that we live in. And it may cost you $500, probably not a lot more than that, to sit down with an attorney and ask them to help you go through those documents. And in the DVD, what I did, I brought together a divorce attorney I brought together a female divorce attorney. I brought together a female investment advisor, a female estate attorney, and a female banker. And each one of them talked about the mistakes they've seen women make and how you can avoid them. And so in a, in a one hour DVD, you can get a wealth of knowledge learning from other women's mistakes and be able to put your life in order. And so if you get the DVD, I think it's $29, $19, something like that. And, but the wealth of information will help you put together your plan and the questions that you need to ask when you go meet your own attorney, because you could save yourself hundreds, if not thousands of dollars by educating yourself first before you go see the attorney. I think what's critical is the fact that it allows you to give, put your thoughts down and come up with questions because when you go, it's like a job interview mm -hmm. or somebody's asking you some questions and it's like, oh, you left 15 minutes later, you think of all these other questions that you want to ask and then it costs you more money mm -hmm. to go back. Hey, Barry, I'm going to get a few uh, shots of that stuff because I have 
two minutes on the tape, and then I'm going to switch tapes, okay? Okay, so you want to switch? You want to just switch tapes, all right? I didn't quite get that. Is she coming out to take shots? I'm not quite sure what you said. How about what? Is she coming out? I'm switching tapes. Uh oh. Oh, okay, fine. I thought you were asking. <laughs> Hello. Is there anything? Because I've got, I think, four more questions here. No, I get more than that. Okay. Anything that you really think we should cover? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I have a, a, a real attitude when it comes to the word balance. Yeah. I think women need to understand that there is no balance. There are choices. We all make choices. And so that's kind of a, a bugaboo of mine. Okay. If you want to bring that up. I'll bring it up. Okay, financial mistakes uh, you have made and what you made. What did you do to correct it? Books to consider. How do you stay current in world events and finances? What do you read? How important is it to check on your credit score? A good debt percentage? to keep in mind and adhere to. See his next wave of employment. Top areas you see developing where one to concentrate their efforts. Um, how important is it to laugh at oneself? Sharon as an everyday woman, what are some of your goals, fears, and aspirations? Whatever you're ready. Okay. Uh, is it rolling? What words of advice? Yes, we are. Okay. Sharon, you've done a lot. What would you say has been your biggest financial mistake, and what did you do to correct it? I think it's a habit, and I think um, we all have habits, and we establish habits in our lives. Uh, my habit was I tend, I'm not much of a shopper, so I'm an, but I'm an impulse shopper. So I'll go in for one thing, and I come out with 15 things, and then I don't ever, and then they don't fit. And they end up, my daughter got on me a couple of years ago saying, Mom, you're giving all this stuff to Goodwill with tags still on it. And I go, yeah, I know, I know. And I'm probably spending hundreds and thousands of dollars that, that I didn't need to spend. And yes, people were benefiting from it. But so I, I actually, and, and I, I laugh about it because I talk about it in all my, I mean, there are a few shoppers out there probably watching this right now that probably go, oh, that's me, that's me. Um, so I really did realized that I was an impulse shopper, spending money I didn't need to spend. So I kind of, I started the, a game. I put in a two-minute rule. It's Sharon's two-minute rule. If I'm at the store and I really want something, I'll set it aside and I'll keep shopping. And after two minutes, if I still want it, I'll go back and get it. And I'm happy to say that my daughter came over and helped me clean out my closets about six months ago, and she noticed, Mom, there's only one item with a tag on it. So I obviously, I made a difference. And so I didn't spend a lot of extra money and save money. And it, it, that may sound like a small thing, but it's the habits that we have that can make the biggest impact. It may very well be that if you just combine all your errands on one day a week instead of going every day, you'll save yourself 50 bucks a week on gas. Um, it may be the fact that those eight Starbucks every day cut back to three, save a lot of money. Um, brew your Starbucks at home. Little changes that we can make. And I also, the other big habit I have is ordering stuff and then forgetting that it's on my credit card. And so look at your cable bill. Are you still watching all those movies? Are you still getting the benefit of all those movies? Many of us are spending 50, 60, 70 dollars a month that we don't remember. They're just automatic bills that we're not really getting the benefit from. And so it's the little things that can make a really big difference, particularly in today's economy. It's a good way to start saving money. Mm -hmm. I remember I used to work for, with a woman, and she always wanted a mink coat. Always wanted a mink coat. And I said, well, if you gave up the cigarettes, you'd have your mink coat. Mm -hmm. Well, she never gave up her cigarettes, <laughs> so I don't think she ever got her mink coat. What books 
do you consider the top that people should read in their lives? Um, I think, think you go rich, absolutely. Um, the Richest Man in Babylon, um, Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win and Influence um, People. I think there are lots of books out there that are supportive and wonderful. But I think if you find the one that really speaks to your heart um, and helps you get the courage to, to really step out and do something to improve your life. OK. What books or magazines or television shows do you indulge in to keep current in the financial world, in the world at large? Well, I read Forbes. I read money. I read, because um, it's my business to keep up on, on what recommendations are being made. I read the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times. Um, and, I, and I watch a lot of um, business news on television. Fox is my favorite, I admit it. Um, and then I also watch things with my husband. You know, that's one of the things where we've gotten to the stage in life where it's like, okay, I don't feel guilty anymore watching CSI or NCSI or whatever it is my husband wants to watch. So that we, that's our time to watch TV together. And I don't feel guilty about that anymore. That's one of my favorite shows. When I used to watch television. Credit ratings. How important is your credit? Well, your credit score, which is the FICO score, um, is really your report card in life as an adult. It impacts your ability to borrow. It impacts your ability to, um, to buy a new house. So your FICO score is very important. And certainly what's happened in the last few years with the economy, many honest, law-abiding people who like to save money have been impacted on their credit scores because of things outside their own power. And so we really want people to take charge and look at where they're, get their credit score. You can get it once a year for free. And then do some things to, to improve it. If there's a mistake, write immediately. They have to respond within 30 days. Talk to your creditors. And the, the people don't realize that your credit score is made up of several different components. 35% is your payment history. Most people think that's 100% of your credit score. It's only 35%. 30% is also the type of credit that you have and how much you've actually used of that credit. So 30%, for instance, um, one of the rules that I try and tell people is if you have a $5,000 credit limit, try to keep it under 30% of the full amount. So if you only use 30% of your available credit, that's going to help drive up your credit score because you have credit that you haven't used. And that's a good thing. And so if you're looking at buying a new home or you're looking at doing something and you really need to increase your credit score, pay down your existing balances to under 30% of your credit line. Make sure you talk to the, your, your creditors once you've done that and ask them to report to the credit bureaus what your balance is, OK? So that not only bringing it down, make sure they report it. and then. If you have a problem with payment history and your history over the last 12 months has been good, ask the reporting authority, the, the credit card company or the, the lender, to actually take that off of your credit report. It doesn't hurt to ask. And many of us, there are many times, in fact, on my own, I found errors in my credit report. The other thing people tend to do is they tend to cancel old credit cards because if they're not using them. Be very careful about that, because when you cancel old credit cards, you're reducing your available credit, and you actually can hurt your credit score. So you need to take all these things into, into account and make sure you're doing everything you can to build up your credit. That's interesting, because I was just thinking of canceling a credit card because I don't really use it, mm -hmm. but I have this fee that I have to pay every month, I mean every year, and it's like, wait a minute here something's wrong, but now you're telling me I still have, I'm caught in a 22. Well, I would call them and ask them to waive the fee ah. to keep you as a customer and see if they will do that and then not cancel the card. 
until you get to the point where your credit score is high enough that you can cancel it and it won't hurt you. But all these things are, you know, there's a very complicated formula, so you need to understand all of those pieces. Thank you. I didn't understand that. Um, where do you see the next growth segment of the economy? I mean, if a woman is going to start a business, where would a good area for her to start besides after she analyzes her passion and everything else? But, you know, like kids are coming out of college. They don't have a passion yet yeah. because they're just trying to get adjusted to life. Mm -hmm. And yet a lot of these college graduates can't find a job they're starting all these wonderful new businesses and becoming the next billionaire. Right. Where do you see women starting a business and doing the same thing? Well, there's so many opportunities today because from problems come opportunities. And well, you just referred to Gen Y. That's one of the, the demographics of Gen Y is huge. And so women have the opportunity to provide services to that younger generation. Um, we have baby boomers that are now starting to retire are going to need services in elder care. The, the change in the environment, starting something out that's an environmentally friendly business is something that's a great way for women to get involved and help existing businesses become more environmentally friendly. Telecommunications is, is a huge area worldwide. As we continue getting faster and faster, there are opportunities that come to help businesses become more, um, more uh, be able to communicate more quickly. You know, educate yourself on social networking and be able to get yourself as, bring yourself out to people to help them in getting their social networking up and running. That social media thing has got me so confused. I have tried. It's confusing. They it say is. it's like you need an hour a day. It's a, okay, I need an hour a day. Where's this hour coming from? Right. And it's like across the board. Everybody says it's an hour. Mm -hmm. I think I get up in the middle of the night and I check my emails and <laughs> then I go back to sleep. Uh, excuse me one second. I think the next question we kind of touched on. Sharon, as an everyday woman, what are, your, what are some of your goals and your fears and your aspirations? Well, that's a great question. Um, my, they're all kind of different. My goals are to provide a opportunity for women and young people to get the financial education they need to succeed in a very fun and non-threatening environment. And I really want to give women a break. Um, I get you know, the, the, the term balance, achieve balance in your life, it drives me nuts. I can't stand it because there is no balance. When you're balanced, you're not moving forward or back. You're sedentary. You're st you know, balance means stable, no movement. We're all making decisions. When I'm with my husband, I feel guilty that I'm not at my computer. When I'm at my computer, I feel guilty that I'm not with my family. I make those choices every day, we all do. And so we need to give ourselves a break and say we're making the best choices we can and if we're not happy with the outcome, we need to make different choices tomorrow. And so uh, women feel so burdened. They're what we all think of ourselves, when I do seminars, I ask women to write down on a piece of paper all the labels of who they are, okay? And it's wife, mother, author, entrepreneur, philanthropist, all those things that you started off with. And nine times out of 10, women will not put their own name down. They only see themselves as they are seen by others. And we need to start with who we are. And when we take care of ourselves, then we'll be better at all those other things. Very interesting. What's next on your plate? Well, I'm very excited because, again, we're bringing out the adult game for Thrive Time. 
and it's something that's really so important for a way to learn financial education without feeling like you're being lectured to. But I also am very excited that I still have uh, a new book coming out with the Napoleon Hill Foundation. And it's a manuscript that Napoleon Hill himself wrote in 1938. And it's been hidden for 72 years, tucked away. His family wouldn't let it be published. And it's called Outwitting the Devil. And it'll be out in June of 2011. So I'm very excited about that. It's a very profound manuscript. And it was, is perfect for today's economic environment. Do you want to share? Do you want to share anything with us? Well, you actually started one one of the very first questions you asked me about fear, and it talks about the fact that the work of the devil is done through fear, and the way we get past that is to get rid of the fear and have faith, and so it really brings all of this we've been talking about all together, and how you can take control of your own life and be definite of purpose, have a goal and stay on that goal. And if you are committed to where you want to go, then the devil can't get to you. And that's the whole premise of having faith in yourself, having your passion, your talent, right association, taking the right action, but above, above all, having faith in yourself and persevere. In the closing moments of the show, what would you like to leave the audience with? When you look in the mirror every night, be your biggest cheerleader. It may have been a rough day, it may have been a horrible day, but think of something positive, something to be grateful for. Um, I actually, every day, say the prayer of Jabez, and it's in, the, it's in the Old Testament, and it's something that has helped me in my tough times and in my happy times. And I, it's a mantra, and it, um, my rendition of it, which is probably not exactly accurate, but it says, Dear God, please bless me indeed. means you're asking God to bless you. Um, expand my territory, which means allow me to impact more people than, than I would think possible. So, God, please bless me indeed. Ex enlarge my territory. May your hand be with me, meaning give me the strength and let me speak, you speak through me. Let me do no harm, so do it for the greater good that I may not be harmed. And so that prayer of Jabez is really a, a, a request for blessing and for God to do his will through you. And I say it every day, and it's something that I think can get most people through every, the, the, the difficult times. Sharon, thank you so much for joining me. It's been wonderful. I mean, I've learned so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. If you have any questions for Sharon or myself, please write us here at The Woman's Connection. But most of all, are you working through your fear to succeed? Bye now. <laughs>